is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead me by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. here how are you doing I hope everyone is doing well uh, welcome to Life Point Community Church for our service on August uh, the 8th uh, time is just flying by isn't it I cannot believe that we are in August already uh, well wow. I don't know where the time has gone and I'm so pumped and looking forward to our reopening our physical doors on September the 12th um, and looking forward to that just a few weeks away really um, so I hope in the meantime, you are taking time to uh, enjoy the summer, um, to, you know, go to the beach, you know, have a barbecue with friends or get away to the cottage or whatever you like to do in the summer. Take this opportunity to really enjoy it and do as much as you can, because September 12th, we are going to be meeting again on a Sunday morning. We are just solidifying a, a perhaps a new place where we're going to be uh, and all the details for you, which you will be notified very shortly. Uh, today we're going to hear a teaching from Danielle Strickland. She is part of the Meeting House, uh, the teaching team there. And uh, I've listened to a few of her sermons now and I really, really uh, like the way um, she speaks. So I hope that you enjoy the, um, the message this morning. It's a new series on um, God is Hope. So it's all, it's all about hope and how we can have hope in God uh, it's kind of like a follow-up, I guess, to the maybe the sermon that I did last Sunday uh, and certainly the um, daily reflections or the life moments that we are doing Tuesday to Friday mornings. Uh, I hope you've been tuning in for those. Uh, it's on our YouTube channel and it's also on our Facebook channel, uh, LifePoint uh, Facebook. So I do Facebook Lives every morning, Tuesday to Friday. And I hope that you've been enjoying that as well. This coming week, we're going to be talking about the laws of growth. Uh, so really important for you to tune in and try to get some teaching there as well. I uh, hope that you're enjoying it and I hope that you enjoy the service this morning. I am pumped about it. Um, thank you to, the, to this team of people that we met uh, this past week uh, about the caring, bringing care into our community. And we have got some great ideas that we're going to be 
um, suggesting to you and uh, read our life news on it uh, for some ideas of how you can participate right now but we are looking forward to getting back into caring for the community uh, um, uh, in the fall um, so please keep in tune and keep in contact about that I hope you're doing okay I miss you guys I really do um, I know there's a group of people that I keep in contact with uh, each week I got the cuppa on Monday mornings and there's a group of people from the church that's uh, involved in that uh, which is great to connect with uh, some of you but there's so many of you that I have not been able to connect with and I apologize for that and my heart um, hurts for that as well and um, I would love to hear from you just send me an email or a text or give me a quick phone call to say hello um, because I really do miss you and I think about you all all the time and I'm not just saying that I really do and I hope in September when we come back in person that uh, that all of you will want to continue as a church um, even though things are looking a little different for us there is still a great need in our community um, and there's a great need to be meeting with one another to support one another to love one another and just to care for one another so I hope um, to see you really soon and let me pray as we continue the service this morning father god we just thank you for your love your care your peace your everything that you've given us father and we come to you this morning um, with open arms and open hearts to receive what you will teach us this morning about hope and father as we're not meeting as a church right now i just pray that you'll be with each person and that you will fill their homes and their hearts in their lives with the the hope of God and the grace of God and the peace of God and the love of God and father we just want more of you in our lives we need more of you in our lives uh, like we've been talking about this past week we have the power through Christ Jesus and we need to tap into that power father because that's what's going to sustain us and that's what's going to get us through each day of our lives thank you father for being here today in your name we pray amen, amen. to them god has chosen to make known among the gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery which is christ in you the hope of glory Colossians 1, verse 27. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Martin Luther King Jr. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. Desmond Tutu. To live without hope is to cease to live. Dojatevsky. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. Henry David Thoreau. Hope is the thing with feathers that, per feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Emily Dickinson. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Well, friends, hope, where do we find it? How do we get it in these times of uncertainty? I, I hope, I, I'm sure I'm not alone in this desire to rediscover uh, to uncover hope that will help us root and establish us in something beautiful and help us to partner with God in bringing hope to a world that seems pretty desperate for it right now. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope 
What? Can I get an amen? So that you may overflow with hope. This isn't hanging on by a thread. This is an overflow of hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That uh, scripture verse, Romans 15, 13, is going to be our anchor for the series. May the God of hope (laughs) fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer. That's my desire. That's my own personal prayer, but also my prayer for you as I've been preparing for this. Uh, talk, a hopeful God. Uh, So let's dive in. What is hope? And uh, sometimes hope gets a bad rap, especially when times are difficult. Sometimes when we say we're hoping for something, people confuse hope with wishful thinking. And I want to get uh, really clear right from the kickoff of this series that that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about wishful thinking. Like wishful thinking is like wishy mosquitoes sucked fat instead of blood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's wishful thinking. But hopeful living, that's different. And especially biblical hope, that's that's a little bit different. I want to give you my working definition of, of hope. Hope is the confident expectation and deep longing for God's kingdom to come just like he promised. Let me run that by you again. Hope is the confident expectation and deep longing for God's kingdom to come just as he promised. Okay, so I'm going to give you three um, propositions. I'm going to give you two Bible stories and then one home exercise for you to do to help us to rediscover where our hope comes from in the time in which we're living. Uh, So here's proposition number one. Wishful thinking. Uh, Wishful thinking is dependent on our own capacity for positive thinking. Okay, so this is where you'll find this uh, a lot in the way that uh, uh, psychology, pop psychology will tell you, you just got to wish better. You got to think positively. You have to think positive thoughts, you know, and that's true. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just not a biblical hope. Okay, wishful thinking is dependent on our own capacity for positive thinking. Hopeful living is putting our whole selves into the care of God. All right. And I thought one of the best ways that we could uh, rediscover that our hope comes from God, that God is the source of our hope, is from the very first uh, covenant relationship that God gave with Abraham. So like right from the very beginning. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn if you want to Genesis 15. There's this little story in here that's just so central for us understanding that from the very beginning, people of faith were invited into a relationship with God where everything depended on God, (laughs) okay? And this is just a good reminder when you're lacking your own resources or you're thinking like, I don't have the positivity. I can't like deny the reality of what's happening in the world, which we're all at that place where we run out of our own capacity for positive thinking. We remind ourselves where our hope comes from. And this is Genesis 15. And it's a little story where Abraham, the father of our faith, uh, is is having this problem because he believes God. He he has left already. He's already started a relationship with God, but he's losing hope in his own circumstances. And we can kind of resonate, I think, with how he's feeling right now. So 15, uh, verse one, uh, Abraham says to God, oh, this is verse two, but Abraham said, oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate? So he's struggling because one of the promises that God gave him is that he was gonna be the father of a great nation. And, uh, and he's struggling because he's like, you've said this to me, but the evidence is not here. I don't have any children. And of course he's, he's getting old. This is like, it's getting past ridiculous now. And so he says, verse four, then the word of the Lord comes to him and, and God reminds him of his promise. And he takes him outside. This is one of my favorite verses in verse five. He took him outside and he said, look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, which I know we know you can't, but go ahead and try. He says, and then he says to him, so shall your offspring be. So he again, reminds him of of this promise. And Abraham believes God, but then he also says, uh, go down to uh, verse eight. He believes God. He's like, okay, I get it. Your promises. And then he says, but uh, Abraham said, oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? How can I know? And this is this, this is this, where are we finding our hope? Where are we going to find our hope that's going to get us through these hard seasons and get us through these difficult circumstances and get us through the things that we think are going to happen, but we have no evidence for them yet. 
And, uh, and so God says in verse nine, he says, bring me um, a heifer and a goat and a ram and each three years old. So here's what's happening right now. God is going to make a covenant with Abraham. Now this is uh, in Abraham's time. This is a very familiar thing that all of the tribal folks in that region would have been familiar with. It's called to cut a covenant or a beret. And what it is, is it's this agreement. It's an allegiance. It's like um, you're giving your allegiance to one another as tribes. And this is partly survival. Uh, it's partly like to build an alliance of support for one another so that when you're in trouble, you're going to come to each other's rescue. And what happens is, you can read the story in more detail, but what happens is Abraham sets this covenant up. And what it is, is they take these animals, they cut them in half, they spread them out. And then the two parties of the agreement would walk uh, through these animals, these two pieces of animals, and they would make this covenant, this agreement with each other to have each other's back. You know what I mean? To like be in this together. Uh, and basically the gruesomeness of the covenant, the cutting of the covenant in that day is that if you don't keep your side of the covenant, you're going to be like those animals. That's kind of that. So it's not, you know, it's not the best, uh, but this is the tribal understanding of that day. So Abraham gets everything ready and then uh, let's, have a, let's have a look at what happened. He gets all ready. And verse 12, this is what happened. So the sun setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep. What's really interesting about the deep sleep there is it's the same word that is used in Genesis 2 when God is, uh, puts Adam into a deep sleep and then from Adam creates Eve. It's sort of this fullness of the creation and it's all about relationship. It's this fullness of the creation. You're not supposed to be alone in this, which is its own interesting thing. So he puts him in this deep sleep like Adam. There's something more. There's more that's coming. And then a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. That thick and dreadful darkness, really interesting there too. This is just evidence of like something glory. It's sort of foreboding. We'll recognize it if you read other passages, like in Exodus, when Moses meets with God on the mountain, it'll say a darkness descended and uh, people become afraid. You know, it's this evidence of God's glory coming. And then the Lord said to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers. He gives him a prophetic word of like what's gonna come. He gives him this sort of picture and this is not gonna be all easy. The circumstances are not gonna be like clear. This is gonna be confusing and long and difficult. But, uh, but uh, skip ahead here to verse 17. Okay, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Okay, now just a couple of things. Smoking fire pot, a blazing torch. In other words, Abraham did not pass through the pieces. But um, the evidence here is that uh, God did. The smoking fire pot, so there's this, uh, this is like a portable oven. So it's blazing furnace and then a blazing torch, which is, so you, you have to keep in mind, heat and light. These are all evidences of God's glory and God's presence. The light, of course, very, some uh, commentators suggest this is a theophany, which uh, is a really fancy word of saying it's a Jesus sighting in the Old Testament. It's a Jesus sighting. So Jesus said, I am the light of the world, right? And then of course, cuts another covenant, a new covenant uh, in Luke uh, chapter chapter 22, if you want to look at this, at the blood of the covenant, this is drink of my blood. This is a new covenant that I'm making. It's Jesus reminding the disciples of the original way this was going to work. How is our relationship with God going to work? Well, it's going to be God. It's going to be God. God is going to lead. God is going to initiate. God is going to promise. God's word is going to fulfill. God is going to do all the things that God needs to do. God is our source of hope. God is doing this. And then when Abraham wakes up, this thing has been done. When Abraham wakes up, this thing has been done. And why I think that's important is, um, well, we've got to reorientate ourselves again. Just reorientate ourselves that God is the God of hope, that God is our source of hope, that this all depends on him. You see, again, wishful thinking is dependent on our own capacity for positive thinking. Surely, if you're like me at all, you've run out of this. <laughs> I remember uh, years ago when I was preparing for this message, I had this story come back to me. Years ago, I was in the downtown east side of Vancouver trying to church plant there, trying to be a presence there of goodness, a presence of God's promises, a presence of some kind of light. And, uh, and I remember being there for about a year and I had a, a, a woman that I felt drawn to. Her name was Flower. She was a heroin addict on the streets there. And her street name was Flower. I was just talking with her this week, actually. This is what reminded me of the story. And uh, we rehearsed this together over the phone. But I remember 
uh, wanting to be friends with her, feeling drawn, feeling like I really want to get to know this woman, but she was not open to it. For a whole year, she would give me subtle signals, like usually digits of her fingers uh, or expletives that she would just uh, get away from me with like a, a lot of choice words. So I got the hint that she wasn't interested. But one night, about a year into this, uh, this, this presence in the community, moving into that neighborhood, uh, we hit it off. And she just began to pour out her life to me on the corner, really, of Maine and Hastings. And, uh, and I remember thinking, like, this is, amazing. this is just what I've been praying for. We were getting along so well. And then she said to me, Danielle, I've really gotta, I really want to keep talking to you, but I've got I've to shoot up. I'm a heroin addict. I have to use. So would you come around the corner with me while I, while I do that so that we could keep talking? And I remember feeling a little panicked at the time. Like I didn't have a ministry manual that told me what to do in that specific situation. It didn't exist. But I do remember coming to the conclusion that I had prayed for a whole year for an opportunity to connect with her. So I wasn't going to blow it. So I went with her. And here's what happened. I was sitting behind the dumpster, this alley at Maine and Hastings while she tried to find a way. And of course, because of her excessive drug use, it was very difficult for her to do. It took a long, excruciating amount of time. And while this was happening, I was watching the struggle. I was watching this darkness. I was in this terrible, terrible circumstance watching this person struggle. And I, the only way I can describe this to you is that hope began to leave my body. That's what it felt like. It just felt like hope began to leave my body. And I felt, I heard this like cynical accusatory voice. Like you think you're going to help transform a community and you can even help one woman. It was like, blah, it was just hope left me. And then I heard something and this is, I don't even know how to describe this to you inside of me, a voice that I recognize now to be God, the God of hope, the power of the spirit. I heard something inside of my own spirit that said this, flowers were meant to bloom. <laughs> even while I was sitting behind that dumpster, watching my friend shoot up this terrible poison into her life, destroying her life. Even as I heard the trauma, even as I saw the circumstances, something changed in me. Hope began to fill me. And actually the image that I had, even while I was in that, uh, behind that dumpster and there was no life to be found, the image that came to me in that moment was that afternoon when I had stepped out of my apartment in this urban sprawl, you know, cement everywhere and all of this darkness and all of these like cemented over, which is just such an image of like how we've cemented over our lives. I saw this little flight. You probably have seen this too. I saw this little flower just poking through the cement. And actually I, I thought to myself that day, I wonder how infuriating this is to city planners, you know, who just try to keep everything straight. And then this one little flower, you know, with seemingly inconceivable strength, just poking through and like breaking up the cement because life cannot be stopped. And that's the image that I had. And I remember saying to my friend Flower, flowers were meant to bloom. Flowers were meant to bloom. And, uh, and those circumstances changed and she began to seek God and she had this incredible experience where God kept her alive and is still helping her to this day, even through the struggle, even through the circumstances. So just this week, we were reminding each other and it was so funny as I was speaking to her on the phone, just reminding her, you remember when we met? She's like, yeah, do you remember? And we're walking through the story and it was like hope was coming again inside of us to trust God, to believe God, that our hope is not in our own human capacity. If it was up to us, we could despair. I'm telling you that right now. That's where that would lead. If it was up to my own ability to be positive all the time, it would be over. No, hope is rooted. Hopeful living is rooted with Jesus is rooted with God at work in the world. God as our source of hope. May the God of hope <laughs> See, the emphasis is on God. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. And of course, in Romans 15, Paul's writing from a prison. I mean, the circumstances aren't looking good. You have to kind of go like, Paul, are you even in the real world right now? Like, look around. Christians are being persecuted. Like, churches are struggling with sin. They're like fighting with each other. You're in prison for Pete's sake. And Paul says, oh no, my hope is not in these circumstances. My hope is not in the, 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 the world. My hope is not in even my own ability. My hope is in God, that God does what he promises, that God is keeping the word, that God who started this journey is the one that's going to finish this journey in the end. And this is where we find our hope. Here's another uh, idea. 
Um, wishful thinking. Here's another uh, wishful thought. Wishful thinking is waiting for our circumstances to change. And hopeful living is seeing God at work in the middle of our circumstances, okay? Wishful thinking is waiting for our circumstances to change. Maybe one day it'll be different, you know? But hopeful living is seeing God at work in the middle of our circumstances. And for this one, I wanna flip to a story in the New Testament. So if you got your Bibles, this is a good time to flip. I brought my big one, so I, it could be impressive. Um, no, I'm just joking. I just got this. It was the easiest one to bring. But Luke chapter 24, and this is a famous story. Usually we preach this after uh, Easter. So I, I, I'm sorry if I'm ruining this for everybody, but this is important because it's what Jesus is restoring hope that changes the life of the disciples after his resurrection. Okay, so this is Luke chapter 24, and this is on the way, uh, on the road to Emmaus. So this started at verse 13, if you're tracking with me. And this is a familiar, some of you might be familiar with this. Some of it might not be. But this is basically two of the disciples are going to a village called Emmaus. This is seven miles away from Jerusalem. Now, all you need to know about Emmaus and this circumstance is Emmaus is the place where all the spas are. <laughs> okay, that's it. Emmaus literally is escape, 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 if you're Dory. Escape, get out of here. Like this is bad news right happened, right? So this is even after the resurrection, but the disciples still don't understand what's going on. They're confused. They're afraid. Uh, they're afraid for their lives. They're afraid for their safety. They're afraid for their sanity. They're afraid, like this is a hard spot to to be in, stuck in Jerusalem when all of this stuff is going on uh, after Jesus has been crucified. And so they're taking off. They're just like, we're out. We're tapping out. Like, I cannot. And so they just tap out of this whole situation and they're on the way to Emmaus. And then while they're walking to Emmaus, uh, Jesus appears among them, but they don't recognize him. So he, uh, he appears like a stranger and he begins to ask them, what's going on? What are you discussing together? You don't sit, seem too happy. And then they're basically like, this is a funny story because they're basically like, are you new? <laughs> and it's funny because we're in on that this is Jesus and that they're like, are you new? Are you new here? And uh, anyway, so they pour out their hearts, you know, about Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, this is verse 19. We had thought, we had thought, we had thought. And here's what I want. Verse, verse 21, but we had hoped. This is what I want to get to. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, uh, then we went to find his body, but his body wasn't there. And then these women came back, you know, who were telling us these fantastical stories about angels. So they're basically telling the, telling the exact things that are happening. And then Jesus is just like, are you new? That's, I mean, I'm paraphrasing in verse 25. Are you new? Like how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Okay, so Jesus is basically like 101-owing it. Guys, this is exactly always has been foreshadowed. I mean, God is always promised and you can count on God that this has always begun with God and it will end with God and you've got to reorientate yourself to the fact that your hope is not in the circumstances. Your hope is not in Rome. Your hope is not in Israel. Your hope is not even in women. Although let, let's revisit that. Like you should believe the women. Anyway, your hope is in what God is doing. Your hope is in what the power of God wants to do. And so they invite him to stay. And this also deserves a whole series on hospitality and how welcoming the stranger actually could bring such revelation and usher in the power of the spirit in ways we can't even imagine, but save that one for later. He breaks the bread, gives thanks for it. And they are, something happens. Their eyes, listen to this, this is verse 31. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us, right? We're back to fire, we're back to heat, we're back to presence, we're back to revelation, eyes open, look at the stars, people count them up. You know, can you? No, you cannot because God is doing something that is beyond even our capacity. And uh, he opens the scriptures and then they get up and return. And we'll talk about that in a second, okay? So this is not a change. What has changed in these people's lives? Like what has changed? Nothing. They're exactly, exactly where they, the only thing that has changed in these disciples' lives is their perspective. The only thing that has changed is that Jesus has opened their eyes and burned their hearts with this expectancy, with this anticipation that God is still at work in the world, that there is still stuff to do. You know, like the, what has changed is them. They have changed. Their perspective has changed because they've been with Jesus. God is our hope 
And then God helps us to see the hope. He, hel- he helps us to see, to understand, to open our eyes and to burn in our hearts with this expectancy of his kingdom coming. I was remembering a snorkeling trip I did. And uh, I was with a friend, uh, just the two of us. And it, it was just like a 10 minute boat ride off of where we were. We were in Mexico and we were going snorkeling. And I remember exciting. I love snorkeling. I love seeing sort of all the stuff open under the water. And uh, we went out there and we had a local guide, a Mexican guide, and we got in the water and I remember just being so disappointed. Like it was just brown and green, you know, it was like blah, like, you know, you're looking for coral reef. You're looking for like the color. I mean, I've been to, I lived in Australia, so I've been to the Great Barrier Reef and I've done the Shemla Shack in Egypt, you know, the top two snorkeling spots in the world. And, and but this was just kind of like, Meh. and I was just like, well, you know, it is what it is. But then our guide did something remarkable. Our guy just tapped me on the shoulder and was like, gave me the signal, follow me. And he would take his finger or his snorkel or like a stick and he would, he poked into this spot in this, what looked just completely like blah, coral and out popped this lionfish. I'd never seen a lionfish before. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's like crazy, crazy fish. It's like, and out popped this lionfish. And then he took his snorkel and he, he, he tapped the back of this hole. And then out of this hole came this lobster, the side of my, the size of my couch, you know, like, and all of these things, this, what looked so blase turned into this incredible, I remember him diving down to the bottom and like scooping up what felt like sand, what looked like just some sand. And I was like, he's going to bring sand up to me. And he brought up this stingray that had just been hiding under the surface of the sand. And in so many ways, as I've been preparing for this and rediscovering hope for myself, I realized that it, it is not about uh, 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 the thing changing that it is that we're looking at. It's like how we're seeing it. It's asking Jesus to be like that snorkeling guide that day who will point out, who will show us, who will give evidence, who will make appear what is already there. Hope is everywhere. Like these disciples on the Emmaus walk, you know, we had hoped and they're just listing these circumstances. And then Jesus is just literally going back over the same circumstances from an eternal perspective. (laughs) Like, let's rehearse this again. So I'm not in the grave. Oh, I see. So the women had angels appear to them to speak. Oh, I see the scriptures had told you, but he's rehearsing all of these things. And then, of course, in this one moment of revelation, the disciples' perspective completely change. Not their circumstances, their perspective. Which leads us again to one more proposition. Wishful thinking leads us to passive acceptance of what is. Wishful thinking leads us to passive acceptance of what is. Hopeful living leads us to partner with God in working for change. I want to say that again, because I I think this is so central because sometimes what happens is on that first proposition, when we talk about everything depending on God, sometimes people are afraid of this because it means, we think that it means that we'll just give up too, that, oh, well, I guess God will have to do something. And it leaves us as passive uh, participants or spectators. But actually the opposite of that is true. When we actually understand that our hope, our source of hope comes from God and he changes our perspective, fills us with possibility and anticipation about how he's working in the midst of what looks like dangerous or horrible or blase or despairing circumstances, we start to get a glimpse of how he's at work. Then the invitation then, this thing fills us. The power of the spirit is us being invited to partner with God in exploring what this means, in working for a better future. Uh, In a podcast last week, I was talking to Sandra Van Opstel, a friend of mine who works for justice everywhere. And we were talking about uh, scriptures or theological ideas that had blown our mind and sort of blown up our lives and changed our perspective. And I asked her what hers was. And she says she remembers when she was going to seminary and she had a professor and her, her professor said this, Christians are springtime people. And she said, what on earth does that mean? And he said, Christians, people who are filled with hope are the folks who announce springtime to the winter. And I thought, what a great reminder in the midst of, can you see the buds on the trees? That this thing that happened, we're springtime people. We're saying to folks in winter, don't worry. It's not too late. That God has something in the created order, this plan of redemption. It's not too late and it's not too hard. Flowers were meant to 
bloom. You want to see? And we can open our lives and our, our eyes to God who is at work in the world to show us where all of these wondrous things already exist. And we can partner and we can become beholders. We can become participants. And this is what happens with uh, in verse 33 of the Emmaus Walk. Verse 33 is one of my favorite. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. In some transitions, it says they ran back. <laughs> I love this. They ran back. They walked slowly away in despair. And then when they found their source of hope, when they saw hope uh, in all of the, even the same circumstances that they once looked through lenses of despair, they see hope there instead and they run back. Now think about this. It took them hours to get there. And now they run back and it's even night. They can't even stay the night. I mean, the reasonable thing to do would be to stay the night because everyone knows you're not supposed to travel at night. Stay the night and in the morning, let's make a, a measured response. There's nothing measured anymore for them. They cannot wait. They cannot wait to get back to what it was that they just ran away from. In other words, they're not going back to anything different. What has changed is them. What has changed is their perspective. What has changed is this radical invitation that they've received by the resurrected Jesus to participate in springtime. The kingdom is coming after all. It is not winter forever. There is not this despair that hangs over us because even in the midst of these circumstances, even in the conditions that the world is in right now, we are a springtime people. Jesus is giving us eyes to see things a totally different way. Not a change in our circumstance, not wishful thinking, not passive acceptance. Oh no, no. We we will rage against the night because we know something that other people don't know. We know that God is at work in this world. We know that God has promised to bring redemption. We know that God has promised to save us. We know that God has promised to be with us. We know that God has promised to comfort us. We know that God has promised to save this world, including you and me. That's where our hope comes from. And so we get back up and we run back in, right into the thick of the fire, right into the worst of the circumstances because we have something to say. And this is what they say to him. They find the 11 gathered together, still afraid, still frightened, just trying to stick it out. And they say this, it's true. <laughs> It's true. The Lord has risen. This is true. I know it sounds too good to be true. I know it's hard to believe. I know your circumstances don't say so, but it's true, guys. We recognized him and he's changed the way that we've seen the world. Isn't that incredible? So a couple of weeks ago, I, I do these once a month prayer days and we were doing a prayer day and in our prayer guide was this exercise and it's called beholding. And I thought maybe this would be a wonderful thing uh, to practice in our lives as we as we embark this series. First of all, just to also go back to Romans 15, 13, may the God of peace fill you with joy and peace as, or the, sorry, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. You see this? The God of hope, it's God who's hope. We trust, that's what we do, as we trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. We would run back into our circumstances. And I, I mean, even to say that is so hard because like, can you run back into Zoom? I don't know. Can you run back into the circumstances that you're in, but with a renewed perspective that God is at work with the world, poking at things that already exist, going, look at this. This is beautiful. This is wonderful. I'm doing something and you get to be part of it. Yes, I believe all this. So beholding is this exercise where he has, when he does spiritual retreats, this guide, he draws, a, he has them before they go on a walk. So they all go on a prayer walk. Before they go on a, a prayer walk, they draw a line in the sand or draw a line in the dirt. I practice this so that I wouldn't be preaching something I don't practice. And I'm going to show you a picture. This is my sidewalk. I did this the other day. I drew a line with some chalk on my sidewalk. You see how the snow's melting? Yes, we're springtime people. We're springtime people. Keep hope alive, everybody. So I drew a line with a chalk. Behold, I wrote there. Behold. And this is it. It's an invitation or a, a call to a different style of attention. Okay? So this is where once we cross that line, this is the invitation. This is the exercise. Somehow we begin to ask God to help us truly expect things on the other side of that line to be special, to be invitational, to be a kind of manifestation, evidence of him at work in the world. And so I did this the other day. I just went out. I was just going on a walk, keep my sanity. And I drew a line and I pressed behold. And I said, God of hope, may the God of hope <laughs> fill me with joy and peace as I'm doing this walk, as I'm observing this neighborhood, as I'm going about my life so that I would overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And I just, uh, I had all kinds of manifestations happen, but I recorded one for you. I took a picture here, the next picture. This is just me walking by a construction site. And all this is, that this is fascinating. All this is, is a crane and it's like a hinge for a crane. Someone who does construction knows more about the practical nature of this thing. It's just a hinge, <laughs> but it's shaped like a heart. Can you see that? Or is it just me? It's shaped like a heart. And I felt like God was saying to me, this construction season that we're all in, you know, this rebuilding of our lives, of our church, of our, our, li- our relationships, this rebuilding is love. This is going to, you're going to build your life on love. That was just one of the beholding moments, but there were so many. I just didn't want to bore you with my own walk because I want you to do your own. I want you to behold the God of hope this week. I want you to challenge yourself to see the world differently, to ask God to give you perspective, to not just be a passive acceptor or just try to wait it out with, you know, just if I can just get through or to hang on by the edge of your uh, seat. No, I want you to be overflowing with hope. I want you to have a renewed perspective of who Jesus is and that he can fill you with the power of his spirit (laughs) to find a source of hope, which is not conditional, unconditional. This is on God. He's your source of hope who can actually change the way that you view yourself, your life, your relationships, your community, and the world. God is at work in this world and then invite you to partner in. And here's what I'm hoping. Rather than us just constantly trying to escape, rather than us just constantly numbing ourselves to try to get through this season, rather than us just moving off, just trying to white knuckle it through. And I know those things are true and circumstances are hard. I know all of that stuff. It's not a denial of reality. It's an acceptance of eternity (laughs) in the here and now. It's an acceptance of God's work that he has for us. And I want you, just like those disciples in Emmaus, to run on back right into the thick of what it is that you live in, to behold what it is that you've been invited to partner with God in doing. (sighs) Hope. Listen, let's pray together. And I'm going to pray just right out of this verse, Romans 15, 13. This is Paul's prayer as he's in prison, as he's a prisoner of hope. It's his prayer to the church that's in circumstances that are struggling. It's his prayer to us today who are trying to deal with the ramifications of the season in which we're in right now on all of the areas. This is the prayer. If you want to open your hands to receive this, I invite you to do that as a posture that opens to the ways and the will of God. And I'm going to pray this. May the God of hope, God, you are our hope. May you fill us with joy and peace as we trust in you so that we may overflow with hope through the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen. 